Breath of Life presents Relentless Pursuit with Pastor Walter L. Pearson, Jr. Join us now as Pastor Pearson continues his message from 1 Kings chapter 19 on Elijah. Here is the challenge, because, you know, we all look at the Bible, and if we even believe in it, we say, ah, yeah. There wasn't much drama in that. Look, for three and a half years, Ahab and Jezebel have contacted all the nations within reach. And they have said to them, search your country for a man named Elijah. You'll be able to find him. He dresses funny. Coarse garments. You'll know him also because he says amazing things. He He's caught him with some, some power trip that we don't understand. We don't care if you like him or not. Find him! And we want him here. And every head of state had answered, we can't find him. Makes me wonder about some things that are happening, happening concurrently. But I'll leave that alone. Now God says, go and show yourself to Ahab. Let me tell you something. You've got to have some faith now because the whole country is dry and parched. Some parents have lost their children because they can't feed them. Is the place stirred up? These people have complained to anyone who was in authority, and they say, what's happening? What's causing this? And Ahab's answer was, it's a strange-looking man named Elijah. They blamed him for it. And God says, now I want you to go to Ahab. Go show yourself to him and tell him that if we can work this thing out as I instruct you, there'll be rain. <laughs> so, you know, if you know God well enough, you're not afraid to go. I don't care how hard they've been looking for you. They're going up there in his face. Because if God be for you, who could be against you? So are you afraid of Ahab? I don't think so. God has hidden you. Now he brings you out. So instead of running into uh, Ahab, Elijah runs into Obadiah, who is the governor of Ahab's house, a man who believes in the God of heaven, who during the interim, when Jezebel went out to kill every prophet of the God of heaven she could find, this man hid a hundred of them in a cave by fifties. Now, you know, you got to have some serious relationship with God to disobey the man whose house you are governor over. But if God is in your heart, you get holy boldness. You don't, you don't get silly, you get bold. There is a difference. So he's still working in the house of Ahab and Jezebel, but he has hidden a hundred of the prophets of God. And now he runs into Elijah. Now, here's how this goes, and I know you don't think it ought to be traumatic, but what has happened is that every head of state that has answered back has said, we can't find him. We heard he was here, but when we go to look where they said he was, he's not there. <laughs> how many believe God can do that? Some of you in here worried about your enemies right now, what they're going to do to you. You know something, if God is with you, your enemies can't find you. They'll go where people said you were. <laughs> people are usually wrong anyway, so that's not a miracle. But even when you need a miracle, God can make you not be where they thought you were. So uh, Obadiah says, uh, whoa, how you doing? Uh, I'm doing fine. How about you? Uh, okay. He said, go tell Ahab I, I want to talk to him. It's, please. Please, you know I respect you. You know you and I believe in the same God. But if I go tell him that I found you after all the people he's contacted to find you, and then I come back with him and you are not here, Elijah, I'm going to be gone. You know, I've been playing a pretty, pretty decent balancing act living in the man's house, believing in the God that you and I know to be true, 
but I don't know whether I'm willing to take that risk. Why don't you go tell somebody else to go get Ahab for you? Elijah says, no, I'm staying right here. Bring him. I'm not going anywhere. Your life is not in danger. You can trust my word. So Obadiah goes and says, uh, Ahab, uh, uh, sir, uh, this is not an easy thing to say. I have found somebody you've been looking for. Who is it? Well, do you want to sit down, sir? Oh, sit down. Tell me who it is. It's Elijah. You have found Elijah? Sir, I did not find him. He found me. Remember, you were out searching for enough water to keep our, our livestock alive. And I was too. We split up at your instruction. I wish we had been together because then I wouldn't be worried about this conversation. But he did not come to you. He came to me. And he told me to bring you to him. Incidentally, if you serve God, God will bring your enemies to you from time to time. When Ahab shows up, you know something, when you've been looking for somebody for a long time and you've been thinking about all the horrible things you're going to do to them, and then you run into somebody who knows the Most High God, and you recognize that you're not going to be able to do what you thought you could. In fact, the closer you get to them, the more of God's influence you feel, and you realize that I better be careful what I do because the power that's with him is greater than the power that is with me. I got soldiers, but he's got God. All that stuff he said, you know, I'm sure he had some conversations with Jezebel and said, you wait till I find him. When I first lay eyes on him, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cause his life to be miserable. But now that he comes into the presence of the man of God, all he can say is, art thou he that troubleth Israel? <laughs> hey, guess what Elijah says? See, you folk you got to understand that when God endorses your ministry, you don't have to back down. You don't have to walk around with hat in hand. You shouldn't be mean to people, but you don't have to go around acting as though you have no power. When you've got God on your side, you got power. <laughs> look, look at this. Look at this. Here is a man with power, and so he says, you are the one. You and your father's house are the ones who brought the trouble on Israel. He said, I've come to uh, bring you a proposition from God. I'd like to, for you to get all of the prophets of Baal, 450 of them. I'd like for you to get the prophets who eat from your wife's table, 400 of them. I'd like for you to bring them with you to Mount Carmel. Bring two bullocks with you. And here is what I propose. Why don't we settle this thing about who is really God? It's time to stop halting between two opinions. You know what I think is wrong right now with most Christians? We halt between two opinions. We want to be with the Lord. We want to be on the side of Jesus. But every now and then when we get around powerful people, we want to kind of hobnob with them. So we talk like they want us to talk, and we stop calling on the name of God and try to use euphemisms. Let me tell you something. You've got to make up your mind one day. Whose side are you on? Who is it that really has the power? And so he says, you tell them to bring the bullocks, and we'll meet on Mount Carmel, and when they come, we will, we will make a decision. We will choose which bullock we want. Let them choose. I'll take the one they don't want. And on that day, when we go to make sacrifices, we will bring no fire. And the God who answers by fire will be God. Ahab said, hey, no problem. No problem. I got 850 religious people. You think they can't make fire? Now they go to Carmel. Now let me tell you something. You remember the same God who told him to go to, to the palace of Ahab and Jezebel? And he was fine because God sent him. The brook Cherith? Fine. God sent him. Zarephath? Fine. God sent him. Carmel? 
I worry about this. God told him what to do. And if you take God's plan, you're fine. So there was never any doubt in this prophet's mind because he knew that if God sends you, it's done. It's done. You don't understand what I'm saying. There's somebody worried about tuition. Well, if you're not on God's side, keep worrying. Keep worrying. Somebody's worried about what the economy is going to do to my parents and how will they do. If, if you're not on God's side, keep worrying. Because nobody can allay your fears except the God of heaven. And he can make all things right. So, so this, this prophet walks up to Kabul and tells him, why don't you go first because there's more of you. <laughs> and 850 religious people along with thousands who represent Israel. They are there when, when Elijah says, Choose ye this day whom you'll serve. And when he puts the question to them, all those religious people, I see some folk don't think about that, but all those people had claimed that they were children of Abraham that they were God's children. They were children of God Jehovah. And yet when Elijah puts the question, he can't get an answer. Like some folk in churches. I'm not saying everybody's got to be saying amen at the top of your voice, but when you hear some truth, you ought to at least respond in some way to truth. But he says, whom will you serve? And the people said not a word. If there's one thing that God hates, it is neutrality. People who don't believe in anything. And if you don't believe in anything, you are liable to fall for anything. So, so the people are quiet. And then they start. And uh, you, you've heard about it. You've heard preachers uh, go on and on about all the practices of these religious folk. How they, uh, they were somewhat loud in their remonstrations. And how they cut themselves eventually because they were calling on Baal. They wanted him to show himself, bring fire down. I happen to know from one of my favorite writers that the prince of the power of the air was there, and he tried his best to get some lightning on Mount Carmel. But when Satan was there with his princely power, God was there with all of his angels, and they would not let the lightning come down. It might have come down low, but it could not touch Carmel because God was not about to allow Satan to mess up this day. This was a day of choice. And incidentally, Elijah was watching too. Some folk think because you pray, you don't have to watch. You know? Like, hey, 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 hey. What you doing over there? Well... I just had these two little rocks, you know, and I, I was just, you know, seeing what they would happen if I would kind of rub them like, put the rocks down. Your God needs your help with little rocks? I thought your God was powerful. Tell Baal to bring the fire. Put the rocks down. Well, I didn't know you were looking. I'm looking. <laughs> I'm praying, but I'm watching. And all day long, they got to noon, and then... Elijah starts doing something that most people think is, is really out of place. You know, some religious people don't have a sense of humor at all. And, and I don't want to hurt your feelings, but what is wrong with you? When, when you're happy and you know it, when you got Jesus' joy in your heart, uh, when, when you look at the fruit of the Spirit, love, the first thing that happens after love is joy. So if you don't have any joy, I'm wondering if you got any spirit. That's joy in your heart. Elijah was up there confident, so when they couldn't get their God to come, he said, maybe he's traveling. Maybe he's hunting. You know? Maybe you need to call a little louder because he may have gone on some trip. Or maybe he's sleeping. My God doesn't sleep. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. But your God may be asleep. Why don't you call him a little louder? And for the rest of the day until the time of the evening sacrifice, those people 
did everything that you have read about. I do not disparage them because I do not poke fun at other people's religious practices. I'm not, I, don't, I, don't, I don't poke fun at that. You do whatever you think you should do within the context of your belief system. But then when it came time for Elijah, he said, you know, calm down. Here's what I want to do. The folk been tearing down the, the, the place where we sacrifice to our God, so let's start off by putting the stones back where they ought to be. Twelve stones for the sons of Jacob. Put them back in place. Then put the board there. And let's cut the, the offering, the bullet. Let's cut it as it ought to be cut. But then I want you to do a little something extra because God is about to show himself. Does anybody know the who knows that God can show up. And when he shows up, there is no question. So he said, I tell you what, bring uh, four barrels of water in that trench I told you to dig and just pour it in there. In fact, go get another load. Bring, make it eight. Go get another load. Make it 12. And they stand around and say, you know, this man right here, I don't know what he believes. And without any kind of, of strange reaction at all, he simply turns his eyes heavenward. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if I'm your servant, and if I've done what you told me to do, separated between God's people, the Israelites, and the Egyptians. It was so high that it looked like it reached all the way up to heaven, and nobody was about to come around it. It was too wide. Nobody was trying to come through it, and they knew from whence it came. It was not ordinary fire. And when those folk looked up, and God made it so that the fire poured down from heaven, and came down and burned up the bullock, burned up the wood, burned up the stones, licked up the dust, and the water evanesced. There was nothing left. And even the prophets of Baal bowed down. The Bible says there will come a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall come. Now, I got to tell you this fast because this, amazingly, is what I came to preach about. <laughs> God said, go to the palace. God said, go to the brook Cherith. God said, go to Zarephath. God said, go back to the palace. Meet him wherever he is. God said, go to Carmel. But now, even Elijah finds himself going where God has not sent him. When, when that thing happened, they went down and killed all the prophets of Baal and all the prophets that ate at the table of Jezebel. And, and you would have thought that that would have meant revival because all those religious people who served strange gods were now dead. Then Elijah says, look, go tell Elijah to, go, go tell Ahab to eat because we can ready to come down from here because God said rain is coming. The servant goes out and tries to see anything happening. There are no clouds. The, the man of God has his head between his knees. He's praying. He says, go back, go back. He goes back six times. Nothing. The number seven, however, has, has the ability of representing perfection. And when he went out the seventh time, he came back and said, Elijah, I see some little cloud like a size of a man's hand. He said, I'm going down to Ahab. I'm getting ready to guide him home now. Because if you see that, God is about to send rain. He goes and tells Ahab, I'm going to take you home. 
strange thing, isn't it? When you stand for God, you don't have to be mean to people. He gets in front of his chariot and the rain starts coming. Somebody say amen for the rain. The rain falls in torrents. He takes this king back to Jezreel to his home and is content to sleep outside in the rain. If you've been predicting rain by the power of God, the best thing for you to feel on your body is rain that God sent. So in the rain, he sleeps. And I'm sure the man of God thought it's going to be wonderful. When Jezebel hears about this, she's going to turn. Her heart will melt. And I don't want to talk about women in a negative fashion in this story because there are some men also for whom nothing is enough. Ahab goes inside and says, Jezebel, you ain't gonna believe. Whoo, I wish you had been there today. What happened? Well, first thing happened was, you know, I told you about this thing about the bullets and we did all that stuff. And, and you know, your prophet, they were good. I got, I got to give them to them. They did a good job. You would have you liked them. Even those 400 who eat from your table, they did the best they could. I'm telling you. I watched them all day long. Those guys gave their all. But something went wrong, Jezebel, and no, no fire came. Then that one man out there by himself called on his God and fire rained down out of heaven and you could see where it started. Well, not quite where it started, but you could see it come all the way down and it, and it ate up the sacrifice and ate up the wood and ate up the stones and ate up the water and then it licked up the dust. Girl, you should have been out there. She said, and you excited about that? Yeah, you, well, you had to be there. And so what happened was, after that happened, all your priests, Bow down. They did what? Uh, oh, I, yeah. They bowed down. And all your prophets bowed down. And at that point, all of us thought it was right to kill them. <laughs> you know, some may have, sometimes I worry about you. They did what? Well, they, they killed us. They gone. Kill every one of them. And I, you know, I just wish you had been there because I think if you'd been there, you'd have been in agreement with it. Oh, you think so? Well, I tell you what, can you get me a messenger? Could you call me somebody? Where is Elijah now? Well, I don't know. He, he led me down here and, you know, I rode on into the property and that's the last I saw him. I don't know what he's doing. Bring me a messenger. You go tell that man, and this is a transliteration now, just as sure as he is Elijah and I am Jezebel, he will be just like my prophets by tomorrow this time. Now, let me talk fast, but I got to talk straight. Do you know what the problem is? There are some of us who think that when a miraculous thing happens, that's the end. It's all over. I went to a week of prayer. I'm changed. It's gone now. We're not, I'm not going to ever have any more problems. I could feel all my burdens floating away. <laughs> Some of us have been around long enough to know that it is right after your greatest triumphs when your greatest trials come. God has not promised until the end to take away all of Satan's power. He will leave Satan with some power. The only thing that we need to know is greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. If you got greater power, then you can deal, right? So this prophet with all of that courage for the first time goes somewhere that God didn't send him. He even came to Jezreel when God said come. But now he heads to Beersheba because he's scared. The voice of Jezebel scared him. Elijah goes to sleep and something touches him, somebody. It's an angel. The angel says, wake up. I got food for you. And there it is over there. It's cooked. Get up and eat. Goes back to sleep. He's awakened the second time. Go eat because you got a long journey. Now listen to this. This is what you must understand. Elijah is now going where God has not sent him. In fact, he is going away 
from where it's supposed to be. And the God some of us believe in would have said, I'm not going to help him. You're on your own. But I'm telling you that God loves us so much that he pursues us even when we're going where he did not send us. And when he finally got to that place, God asked him a question. What are you doing here? I sent you to all those other places, but I didn't send you here. And here is my question. What is God doing there? If I'm running from God, what kind of God would go with me? There are some of you listening to me right now, and you are convinced that because of things you have done in your past that God has forsaken you. And I tell you on the basis of what is written in the Word of God that even when you run the wrong way, God will not cut you off from him. His love extends even to those who are running where he never sent them. And so in that place, there is first a wind, then an earthquake, then a fire. But what God is trying to show this prophet is that even when my answers do not, don't make loud noises, sometimes I'm answering your prayer in a still, small voice. Even when in your life you don't have a Spielberg moment, even when no furniture moves and no wind blows in your house, even when there's nothing that you can go tell your neighbors, you should have been in my house the other night, I felt something. Listen, if God promises you something, you don't have to feel anything in your house. You can take him at his word. So tonight my admonition to you is this. I don't care where you've run. I don't care how many times you've gone without the power of God with you, you thought. God loves you so much that he'll follow you where you run and give you power in that very place. God bless you. Join us next time for more Breath of Life with Pastor Walter L. Pearson, Jr. There's no better way to start exploring the plans God has for you than in the Discover Bible Guides. It's the Breath of Life gift offer this week. Just call our toll-free number at one eight seven seven B O L offer That's one 265 6333 And ask for your copy of the Discover Bible Guides. Or you may write to Breath of Life, P.O. Box 97192, Washington, D.C., 20077. The Discover Bible Guides. Discover for yourself.